contemplating on the way here, how does one summarize of the world, the modern world's most important energy visionary in a three-minute introduction? And I decided that the only way to do it was to offer thanks. So if you heard about tonight's event through your laptop computer, you can thank Dr. Stan Oshinsky. If you shop, when you do shut off your cell phone tonight to make sure that you're riveted by every word that you can thank Dr. Stan Oshinsky. If you drove here tonight like I did in my seven-year-old hybrid Prius vehicle, or in your Chevy Malibu, or even if you just test drove the new Olds and you can't quite get your arms around the fact that it's a GM vehicle, you can thank Dr. Stan Oshinsky. When your screensaver pops up with photos that you took of your six-year-old a few years ago on your digital camera, you can thank Dr. Stan Oshinsky. And when you watched Berlin pitch his no-hitter this weekend, uh, with such clarity on your LCD screen, you can thank Dr. Stan Oshinsky. If you've managed to build a pole barn and you put your photovoltaic thin film solar cells on it, and you're now powering your entire house, and perhaps you can sell your energy back at 12 cents a kilowatt hour to DTV, you can thank Dr. Stan Oshinsky. And even if you're dreaming of the day that you one day may have your own solid hydrogen fuel at home, and you can pump the pedal of your hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, you can thank Dr. Stan Oshinsky. I think it's important for all of us here to not just recognize these incredible contributions that he's given to us, but to realize that so many of them were created right here in Southeast Michigan. So the next time any of us feel discouraged about where we live and the fact that we can only do so much, I think we should think about what we're seeing in And of course, what better organization to bring him to us tonight for his insights than the 40-year-old ecology center for so many years has taken us to places we never dreamed possible and shown us that they have been. It is possible. So let me please join me tonight in giving a rousing Southeast Michigan Ecology Center welcome to Dr. Stan Stanley.
there was going to be a struggle and that nobody really cared about energy conversion or making a better world. And we felt the only way to do it is to do it by making things that will give you the opportunity to do your, your bit and that and that, that sort of, uh, I'll say, crusade. And I think you can see there that we started with the sun. We talked about that. And the hydrogen, we talked a little bit about that. And it, it really was a tabletop experiment because that's the very beginning, and that's all we had. I think most of you know this. Can I speak loud enough? No. <laughs> I don't know, can you? Well, the majority went. <clears throat> um, the amount of energy that falls on the Earth and the sun, uh, an hour's worth of sunlight on our planet provides all of the necessary energy for our planet. That's a very interesting statement, but how do you use solar energy? Because it's the ultimate. Why is it the ultimate? The sun is fusing, that's a better place for fusing atoms than 93 miles away. And it's fusing hydrogen atoms. And it's helium, and the result is radiation, which can give you a suntan, but is otherwise benign. Uh, I would want you to know that the struggle works. Uh, those of you who are in engineering or even in science, you know that the IEEE is a very significant organization, actually, worldwide electrical engineer and you can read it for yourself uh, they now understand you know, they now understand that the only source that's going to make it in order to save our planet is sunlight and if you take all the other lectures put together uh, a mere 1% of the solar up. What's needed is one petawatt, 10 to 15 watts. We'll talk a little more about Therefore, the simplest and the optimal way to provide electricity is the conversion of sunlight into electricity. It has no noise, no moving parts, no steam generators, no coping, nothing but thin, flat sheets of foam tanks made by, it says mild there, but made by the many miles. 30 years. The next slide. So if PV is so clearly green, why aren't we using it now as we should? And the problem is cost. Well, what does cost have to do with it? Everything. If you argue about climate change, if you argue with anyone about anything that's pertinent to making for a green economy, they'll tell you that the price of being green is that it's too high. Too high cost, nobody can afford it. And therefore, you shouldn't be doing it. So, in, as you know that I started United Solar Avonics and ECD back then in 1960. 
what I did was to didn't like actually uh, the fact that after 47 years uh, the company was at that time using my, the machines I designed and built with my colleagues and collaborators and using it as a money machine, not thinking about the future. Because we all have to change. Auto companies have to change when they go out of business. Everyone has to change in order to, and you have to change the world for the better. So what we have to do, I set out to say, I didn't want to stay with the, my beloved company. I wanted to go out and to do what we had said we were going to do on January 1st, 1960. And that is solve the energy problem. If sunlight is the solution, everybody knows these days in science and technology, then the solution is to make solar energy cheaper than burning coal. We take all the arguments out of it. There's no longer this way or that way. This is my opinion. That's your opinion. Economics will take over. The basis of our world economy is economics. And therefore, if you can make it affordable to be cheaper than burning coal, I assure you that you won't have to worry about the minor mining of coal and what it really does to, the, to our society. And I have asked, because I've worked in shops all my life, and in one of them, the uh, rubber shops, they used to call, the miners came from West Virginia, and they called it uh, the gum mines, because we had all the illnesses, respiratory, in our pits where we worked, and that the coal miners, and the solution, I know everybody, and it's very difficult to talk because anybody who's in the field has my support. So I don't want to have anyone think that one thing is better than me. I just want you to remember that you, everything that's being done in materials now, I, I invented an area called amorphous and discarded materials, and that means the thin, that's why we have thin films instead of crystal material. You have to realize that you have to have new science and new technology to make the slogan a reality. You can't do it just by doing everything that you've done before. Oh, well, we'll make, we're going to make millions of them, or trillions of them, and that's going to bring the cost down. And that doesn't bring the cost down. You haven't solved the scientific, technological. And that's why an inventor. Uh, to be an inventor is a difficult task by itself. I have over 400 patents, which helps a bit. Uh, can I go back to so I started Bosinski Solar to, uh, to do exactly what I'm telling you about. And if you see uh, Dr. Chu, uh, uh, the Secretary of Energy, he's, they said that solar technology will have to get five times better than it is today. And he was very dubious and is dubious about doing that. Well, I've got good news for you. That's exactly what we've been able to show is possible. We'll talk about that a little bit. Okay. Uh, okay. Set it. You, uh, you use silicon, not some exotic element, because it's the most plentiful element. There's no danger to it. Really sand, and what you, in order to get to the cost that I mentioned, 
you have to build not megawatt plants, as I've been building for through the years. You have to build a gigawatt plant. And that plant has to be the same size of the megawatt plants. Because everything, and we'll show you why, has to move a lot faster and be a lot more effective than we have now. I'm very pleased and for what we have now. My products have been for solar are beautiful, maybe aesthetically very beautiful, and they have great advantage. What's the problem? There has to be a problem, and the problem is exactly this, that if you run at everybody in my field, the amorphous material who makes photovoltaics, like the United Solar Companies, runs their machines, which I'll talk about and show you, at about one to five angstroms a second. What I had to do is to prove that I could run a machine 300 angstroms a second. If I did, if I didn't achieve that, then I couldn't be cheaper than cool. And I could use ordinary efficiencies, even, say even anything 10% or over, it's a matter of mathematics. I mean, look at that. You take 300 answers a second, take 12% efficiency, you got well over a gigawatt. In one plant, you try to do it serially, you spend something like a sharp bid, seven billion dollars through the years. So, let's go on to the next. Therefore, if you solve those problems of speed, throughput, efficiency, the costs become real. And with thin films, when I say thin, some of them are under 100 inches. The fact then is, you succeeded in making gigawatts. Now, those of you in Ann Arbor that don't know what a gigawatt is, I won't tell you, except I'll tell you it's a long line of zebras. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what my uh, 30 megawatt machine looked like, which is, I've been operating in Arizona, I've a lot of them. And to me, it's looking like a cathedral. I get chills really looking at it. it to me, it's beautiful. Uh, and it runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I hope they still do that. Uh, and produces nine miles That's every single run. Uh, of this thin film photovoltaic. That was very revolutionary for its time, very much so. And being a filmmaker since I was a kid and a, and a machine builder since I was a kid, I, I just loved doing it. It was, it was wonderful. Next slide, please. Here's what comes out of it. These rolls are Mile and a half rolls of stainless steel. As you can see, there's uh, six rolls there. Each one mile and a half material, which we then coat, putting in the machine. That's taking the machine, taking them out of the machine. And that's the product. It is thin. It is lightweight, it's impervious to anything that you might think about. And it is the answer, but not at 30 megawatts. So in order to outdo what I did, I had to go to gigawatts. First of all, I know that 
all of us that are green all want to have something that's aesthetic. We don't want to have something that irritates your neighbor by being big and ugly. You want to have something that has architectural value. So here's a plant, lodging plant in California. And you can see, to me, that's very good. Beijing, China, for the Olympics, they thought they had made a new museum with a beautiful roof. That's that there. Uh, in Germany, Thiessen uh, has a building right by the Rhine River, and they wanted to have a motif of solar cells. That's pretty. That's one capital. That's how it looks at on houses, and this is how it looks in the desert. You're doing above things, running an oil companies. <laughs> <laughs> they make money doing it. <laughs> they won't tell you that. They good for profit. Now, so there are other kind of products of so like solar thermal, where they take big magnification glasses and, and focus it on a very expensive piece of semiconductor to generate electricity. It's big, it's, it's good, and it, it's, it's very narrow in its use. But anybody who wants to buy it or do that, that's fine. They use it. Uh, to make electricity that's usable immediately for utilities. The photovoltaic is direct. doesn't need that. I used to take a great power during rainstorms and then in darkness storms. And what you see there, and you collapse the music because I had invented a triple junction that is. I use most of the spectrum of the sun that's available so that you can play in semi-darkness. I used to get wet, of course, but that's what it is. The, uh, I, direct conversion, okay, look at this. I talk about buildings, but you know, there's so much land that's wasted. What if we had to just think of putting them on roofs or on the sides of it? Why not put them on wasteland? I like it. This is in Europe. Or maybe it's in Japan. And just put them out there uh, on the edges of the highway or train, old train tracks. If you do all that, you certainly will be able to have more energy and clean. No pollution, no climate change gas, and no war over oil. If you want to be green, for gosh sakes, remember that what's bad about all this stuff is not only that coal kills people and makes them sick, but oil kills. All the wars that go on now and have gone on since the Japanese war are over oil. So think about expanding, not just think about one application, but something that you can do universally. And then it's a game changer. I mentioned I mentioned this. The previous thing, single production plant, 150,000 square feet uh, at ordinary kinds of efficiency is gigawatts. And inherently, with a three terminal and, or an nanoparticle, which I had actually 
people talk about it as you did in the 1950s and the technologies. Uh, you can get up to at least 18 percent patients. Next. And this is what we've designed to accomplish that, to make a gigawatt machine or gigawatts machine and make it for every city, every county, every country, because what the world needs is to replace fossil fuels. And now, I want to say that 40%, someone mentioned it, of the fossil fuel is in your transportation. CO2, 40% comes from transportation. Thanks. So, I started, I enabled the, if you drive a Prius or a Ford, any of the Ford cars that are hybrid or, or Honda, or, I don't know, see, you have clean energy because you've gotten rid of a, a heck of a lot. Uh, of pollution. Now, was it easy? Not easy? I uh, built a, we, we built a Chrysler car and made it into an electric uh, van and uh, I thought, slide please, I thought there would be champagne and roses. The automotive companies did all they could to say, you can't do that. And anyway, we did it. But how? Because Japan waited for the stupidity of the automotive company to commit suicide. And then came in Honda, Toyota were licensees. The mine was keeping out to build up American industry. Because by the way, we all know about Detroit. But we also should know that America is not number one as an industrial country. I grew up in Akron, Ohio, the rubber capital of the world at that time. That announced the rubber. That's a basic industry. Nearby was Youngstown. Steel, not any steel. Youngstown, Pittsburgh, forget it. Indiana, forget it. Steel is a basic industry. I come from machine tools. Our machine tools of America were the prime of the world. No machine tools are they being ever made in America. And I could go on with that, but it's too depressed. <laughs> only, only thing I say is we must use our technologies, our science. We must use that to rebuild the industrial base of America. Unemployment is a crime. It's a crime. Poverty is a crime. The idea that we must live in a where people cannot make a living, where school teachers are fired indiscriminately, where culture is, can no longer be afforded. This is not civilization as we know it, as we built the United States. This is criminal. And, no, let's go back. <laughs> uh, therefore, only the United States. Anybody see who killed the electric car? Yeah. Okay, well, you would know the story. But, Japan and Korea came in and they built the electric cars and they built the hybrid cars and what happens is that then American industry has to recoup and can it? Well look at the automotive company. Two of them in bankruptcy. The other one hanging on. Why? Because they were not subject to change. Why? Because they were thinking only of immediate profit. Why? They were not out to rebuild America. They were out to 
to sell. Now you say, well, isn't there an industrial base? I don't know yet. And wonderful companies like Google and Microsoft and, and Intel. Very much so. They do well. But I must tell you that they all sent their uh, to things to be made most to China. We are not building new industries in America. And without the industrial base, we're all going to be children and grandchildren in trouble. Now, I thought I'd show you a little proof of what I've been talking about. This is an old, this came out in 2009 as a uh, advertisement in the magazine. They said that uh, my battery proved its value for 12 years of mass production and is extremely reliable. They said that about uh, 13 billion years of uh, wear on the cars and they are wonderful. And they estimated that the, their hybrid technology, which is basically how uh, you can't have a hybrid if you don't have a battery, has saved millions of gallons of gas and lowered CO2 emissions by billions of pounds. Uh, it goes on to tons these days after those years. What I'm showing you is the fact that it can be done. With struggle, it can be done. And therefore, transportation is impacted and responding and reducing this pollution, climate change gases, but they won't want to get rid of oil. And that's a sad thing. Uh, somebody sent me this, a, a, a famous astrophysicist at the University of Chicago. And uh, he says, Stan, uh, does that sound familiar? Why don't you read it yourself? Uh, can you all read it? That says it all. Quite a guy. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just wanted to start the discussion. I didn't want to give a speech. So I think that this is my last slide. And what I want to tell you is that that young, I'm, I'm going to have to say this very loud, okay? You see a young girl, a young lady, she's barefooted. She's barefooted. She's climbing up a mountain in Mexico that a donkey couldn't get up. She's carrying on her back the future her future, she's carrying for full tags on her back to her village. That's her future because it brings electricity to a place that has to be. Civilization and education to a place that has to be. And she has a future on her back and a future in front of her. That's your child. And I used to say, that kid will go to school. A million and a half people live in the world without electricity. It's a gathering society. This is part of what we have to consider when we speak of the world. Not just our world, but the world where human beings are suffering and going, having one difficult time, getting clean water, watching their children die, and them with not having any electricity, any energy, 
So, future of Harvard, the future in Blackbird, and that child did go to school, and some of them went to university. myself. I was very active as a, a young kid in the trade union movement in the 1930s. I'm still alive. <laughs> Actually, I have a sweet spot because one of the reasons I'm still alive is miners uh, came up. They used to go act in the uh, capital of West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some scabs were coming into a car at night with their lights off right at me. And all around, suddenly, hands grabbed the whole of the car as being choreographed in the ballet and started rocking it. And I had to save the people who were trying to kill me. So I owed my life to miners. But uh, I've done everything to civil rights did not start in the 1960s. They didn't start in the 1950s. I lost my first company because I hired a black secretary. Uh, you have to stand up what, and poor what you believe in. So I think you are the ones I should clap because you're dedicated, you're committed. You're doing everything you can to make understanding the problems, to make the future a, a more livable, more equitable, and a more just one. And that goes beyond science and technology. Still, must be the way that we can rebuild our world again. After that, I don't know how I can answer. And I had great colleagues, 
that man who's out there, his brother was one of my very finest artisans that I've ever had the pleasure to work with. Thank you. He's dead now. Yeah, as you know, our local vice president of research is working on organic photovoltaics, which he argues has the potential for much higher efficiency. Uh, could you comment on that program? Well, I know the fuller, and he's a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> he means no harm. <laughs> But uh, well, I had a Nobelist come to see me. They said he came from England. And he had just come from India, where he's giving talks about organic. Uh, why can't we use organic photovoltaics for this or that? And use chemistry, well, you can't. You need chemistry. And it turns out that uh, What, what am I going to say to him? I said, look, birds fly, but airplanes don't use their wings. They don't go like that. You cannot, uh, you must design, and it's very complex. For example, my batteries, I'm, scientists have said in journals, can only use two or four elements. My batteries run every day on the uh, the fact of the matter is, what you have to do is to, if you can do it organically, give them a Nobel Prize. I mean, that's the only way to do it. But it doesn't work. It is the least efficient of all the things that have been brought up through the years. I've seen it, I've worked with it, and if somebody does it, then do it. I mean, I'd be the, I'll be the first to apply. Anything that solves a problem, everybody should be involved in the solving the problem. But it's a good research program. Question back there. Yes, Stan, could, could you explain potential applications of nanotechnology with photovoltaics? <laughs> Yes. Uh, this young woman sitting with me, my wife, uh, and I did some work back in the 90s. And we actually showed that we could make nano particles of photovoltaics out of silicon that would be very good. The physics, it's a new regime of physics that everything now is nano. But those of you who are interested in science, what nano really is, is not just something very small, but it's got to be new science and technology. Because when you get to the quantum limits, which is what nano really is, you get the quantum limit, you have new physics, you have new chemistry, you have new bonding, and antibonding. And so it's a different world. It's one which I have been working at since the 1950s. And it's wonderful. And it will help very much to bring the revolution further and further. And I hope that it's taught the University of Michigan, because it has so many things that you can use it for, including medications. Yeah. Thank you. There was a uh, program last week on NOVA that talked about this uh, high magnetic magnetism used to separate a couple of, <coughs> it was a color, it was used in, in China. Chinese painted terracotta soldiers, and with, with intense magnetism, they, it separated into two parallel elements that supposedly was going to revolutionize the semiconductor. 
might make a whole new uh, thing, something a whole other level above semiconductor. Did you hear that, or have you? No, I wish it. It was done by this in Florida by this really intense magnetic field that caused uh, these elements in paint. We call the elements, but they, they became parallel, and by and that was something that would revolutionize semiconductors. Well, you know, as a person who's revolutionized semiconductors, uh, I, didn't, I didn't talk about my uh, information to me is encoded energy. So I've worked since the early 50s, and the companies I work with now are ones that weren't in existence. Intel, Samsung, 98% of the, of the world's semiconducting corporations that I work with and work for. And I can tell you that there's many called, but few are chosen. Well, there's uh, several beginnings of an answer. One is uh, the fact that you windmills are solar too, you know. Uh, windmills work at night, so and they can make a lot of things when they're doing that because people don't use that much because uh, that's one way you can couple them. I like that. I invented materials that go in, that are in the pieces and so on that are made of uh, hydrogen ions going back and forth between two electrodes. So hydrogen, I put it into the solid because one electrode has to, both electrodes have to be solid. They have to come in. You can store it that way. I've done it. It's possible. It isn't being worked on right now since I left the uh, When you make progress in one basic thing, the good part of it is it brings up the next problem for you to solve. That's the way we progress. And we, you can do it. It can be done. People, I would put by it. What's the timeline on your gigawatt plant, and what are some of the challenges you face with that? Well, timeline means money. <laughs> uh, I uh, did all of this. Since 19, uh, since 2007, October, I've done all of this with my own and my family. Because I believe that it has to be done. I believe that, that it's my civic, if you know how to solve a problem that's very important to the world, and I felt it's my civic duty to do it, and so I used my own money. That has to stop because I'm unfortunately not a rich man. Uh, we'll see what happens if I can raise the money to do it. But I proved it, and that's the important thing. I don't, uh, I prove it, uh, have the data that you can make. 300, I run things at times in a second with, with a very low density of state. Those who you know about semiconductors, that means good efficiency. And it, 
it can be done. However, it will be done here, like I would like, to rebuild Detroit, to start a new industry. Because if you solve the energy problem, remember, it's like the automobiles in a certain way. If for one job in the automobile, you used to get, I don't know what it is now, but 11 different jobs, new industries. And without those building of new industries, by amplification, by amplification, there can't be any time when we consume and we're not going to have a big unemployment problem. Now, I was brought up in the 30s, in the Great Depression. I've never figured out what was so great about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, we can't have continuous depressions. I showed it. You can see those are old, old cars up there, and that was uh, on houses. Uh, my company decided it wasn't going to go into housing. I had new, new directors. I always had the best directors in the world, so they, I didn't have them. They died off, and uh, and that was one one of the big problems of United Solar is that it did not, I brought them to California and they didn't want it. I brought them to Germany, they didn't want it. Then I said, I can read the cards, you don't want me either then. And so, uh, housing will be and is being, but United Solar, ECD, my company then, Hovonix, that was the name that it makes great materials. They are wonderful. It made great shingles. I was trying to do it again now. They might be able to handle housing now as they should. They have to, because that's what it's all about. I hope I can do better than that. Well, it's argumentative. Uh, a lot of people won't agree with me uh, about hydrogen. So I thought we would not argue about it. We would uh, build, uh, take a, a Prius. A Prius is a good car, it's still the best mileage. And I didn't touch our batteries. We've got hydrogen batteries. Uh, I drive batteries. I didn't touch the engine. God forbid, because uh, the auto companies would get very upset if you touch the engine. All I did was take out the batteries, uh, the uh, gas tank, and put in uh, our hydrogen storage materials. And uh, I can tell you it. There was no pollution, no climate change gases. I did this with colleagues, one of them sitting in the front row, collaborators, a great group of people. I always believe in people and build a culture for our working people. I'm a working person. Nobody works for me, they work with me. So it worked. And uh, I 
did a couple of them actually. People you still drive them. There's one in PCDs, still drivable, I'm sure. No pollution, no climate change gases, no war over oil. All you get is moisture out of it. Okay? And the oil company that I was working with uh, paid me the compliment of taking, trying to take the cars and did it. To, to crush them like the auto company. So, when you're working to change the world, believe me, you must not do it without understanding. And now, good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I just want to respond to that. If you look down the road, I don't see anything but hydrogen for an aircraft fuel. Solar, wind, uh, geothermal, um, nuclear. Storage batteries are too heavy. Hydrogen is a factor of three lighter per unit of energy than uh, petroleum products. Kerosene, gasoline, etc. As long as they put it in the solid, that's where I come in. I would not use hydrogen under high pressure. I would not use uh, hydrogen, liquid hydrogen. That, that sends things to the moon. Well, but in a solid that's reversible, chemically reversible, to tie up the hydrogen and release it. And by the way, I didn't use the, uh, the uh, emission area. I use the, the heating, the cooling uh, tube is what we use. We had enough energy to release. Uh, you're right. Let's have one last question. I'm sitting down on the deck. <laughs> <laughs> Stan, how do you see the uh, progression of the lithium ion extended range vehicle? Hendrick Frisker, if that has the Spisker car, they're using extended range technology. Of course, that's in the full, you know, Bob Lunsford was part of it. Could you talk about that a little bit? Or? What was the last part of it? Oh, uh, well, of course, the full car is oh. an extended range. Uh, it's extended range, but it doesn't use hydrogen. It uses lithium, as you said, and gasoline. The extended range is a way companies change things so that they have a twist of the, the, that the bolt uses gasoline to recharge, which is a good idea. To recharge. I think what I was trying to get at is how will that evolve compared to strictly electric vehicle? You know, like the, uh, what's that the Honda is going to use EV and the electric Oh, I believe in electric vehicle. I think that's, uh, that, that's it's a It's a great idea for. A, a, a city car. It's a wonderful idea for a city car. And uh, I drove the first EV ones, and I can tell you, they were marvelous and beautiful. They worked very well. Thank you.